Amen. If you're able to, would you mind stand, standing for the reading of God's word just to honor his word as it's set apart and holy and for us? Our scripture today comes from Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 21. Here's what Jesus says. You have heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Y'all can be seated uh, this morning. So for the next six weeks, what we're going to be seeing in the scriptures is that Jesus is basically taking selections of the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and he's, he's basically um, exposing them at a heart level um, because the context of the, of the kingdom of God at this point when Jesus enters in and walks among those on this earth is that the, the religious elite are the Pharisees and scribes of the day, and they are big on the external commitments to the moral law. Um, and Jesus wants to do something different with the law. He doesn't want to take anything away. He just wants to press it deeper into exposing, um, exposing the heart motivations of our sinful proclivities. And the good news for us is, is as we hear this, we don't have to settle for the mere apparent behavioral conformity while our hearts are being ruled by sin. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Where it's like your life appears to be together. Everybody looks at you and they think, wow, your life is together. But inwardly, you, all you can think about is how condemned you feel because of the sin that is ruling your heart. Do you, do you, do you understand that? Have you been there before? Maybe you're there this morning. Well, Jesus, Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. He doesn't want us to be held in bondage to our sin. And so today our passage talks about murder, but specifically about anger, kind of the murder before the murder, if you will. And he, he goes on to talk about uh, how important it is to, to deal with unreconciled relationships. And he uses a couple of illustrations about that. And he, and he talks about some different facets of how anger manifests itself, whether it be with an insult or a, a curse towards someone. Um, but the thrust of it all is anger. And because I, I preached a sermon recently on reconciliation, that's really where I'm going to focus today is on this idea of, of anger. I don't know how anger is expressed in your heart and life today. And I don't know how it bubbles under the surface for you, but the Holy Spirit wants, to settle, wants us to settle in this morning and confront it. Um, he wants us to confront the heart postures that we each have that evoke an angry disposition. So the first bomb that Jesus drops here in Matthew uh, 5 for us is he says, You've heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, but I say to you, whoever is angry is liable to judgment. Um, so, so I, I'm reminded of a story of my own history with anger this morning as I, as I kind of talk about this. And it was one of the most challenging days of my childhood, for sure. It was the day that I made the high school baseball team. And let's just say it was one of those situations where my sin found me out, you know. I don't know if you've had a situation like that before. Um, but years, years earlier, uh, Coach Barnes uh, was... Uh, Coach Barnes was the baseball coach, but years before that, he was a rec league uh, basketball referee. And I just so happened to play basketball, and I hadn't connected the dots that that referee was the high school baseball coach. And uh, when he invited me to join his baseball team, he pulled me into his office and he says, I almost cut you. Not because of your baseball skill, but because of your past. I'm thinking, What? He said, when you were younger, you were one of the angriest kids that I've ever encountered before. And then when he started to say this, it all started to click in my mind. Because my fifth grade year of rec league basketball, I held a stat. And it was not a stat that you wanted to hold. I had the most technical fouls in the whole league. I had four my fifth grade year. I can remember one of them clear as day. 
the, the, the ref says that was a walk, and I take the basketball and go, boom, and it goes up to the rafters. I was so angry. Whether it was, you know, getting, uh, you know, talking smack to an opponent or whatever it was, I had four technical fouls that year, and I was so angry, and everybody could see it but me. If you've ever been around someone that has explosive anger, it's hard to be around them, isn't it? And if you, if, you, if you don't know what that's like, you might be that person, okay? Um, and as I think back on it, um, you know, I can see it much more clearly now. Uh, I was so angry because I so desperately wanted to be known by other people. I wanted to be popular. I wanted to be loved. And in my mind, athletics was the ticket. And anything that threatened to take that away from me or, or told me a different narrative than the one that I wanted to hear... Um, was an obstacle to be destroyed. Everyone could see it but me, and that, and that, um, that is until I came to Jesus. You know, there's, there's always something deeper going on in the heart that's surfacing through any of our anger. Sometimes, you know, when we meet Jesus, the struggle, we, you know, the, the struggles that we had um, in, our, in our BC days or before Christ days, like what I did there, um, um, they just go away. They miraculously are taken away. And other times we struggle with them until, you know, the day that we go to be with Jesus. For me, anger was one of those things that the Lord just kind of miraculously removed from my heart. And I'm not saying that I don't get angry anymore. My children could certainly tell you that. I repent at least once a week, sometimes once a day on this. But um, it's one of those things that, that Jesus just kind of took from me because his love began to fill my heart and push out all the anger uh, that was uh, so focused and channeled in on making a name for, my, for myself. And so today, um, what I want us to lean into is, is just really this topic of anger. And I want to look at it from two different angles. The first angle is this. I want to look at the heart of anger. And then secondly, I want to look at the redemption of anger. So let's look at the heart of anger together. Uh, here's what I'm discovering about anger is that anger is a byproduct of love. Ang- Let me say that again. Anger is a byproduct of of love. People that are angry are people of deep passion, of deep love that is often misdirected. And so let me me explain more of this. If you've got a Bible, I want you to open up to Deuteronomy chapter 6 this morning. I think that anger is proof that love exists within God first and then within us as well. And so we have to see that anger is ultimately an echo or a distortion of God's God's anger. Now this Deuteronomy 6, this, what I'm going to look at right here comes right after the Ten Commandments, okay? So, and if you remember, God wrote the Ten Commandments out twice on stone tablets and Moses broke the first ones because he was angry, right, when he came down the mountain and he saw the sin of the Israelites bowing down to a golden calf. And so here's what he says after all that happens. He says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to you, with great and good cities that you didn't build, houses full of good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. In other words, all of this grace, all of this undeserved Uh, material blessing. And he says, when you eat it and you are full, take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for it is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name shall you swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the other people that are around you, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God meaning he is envious for our complete and total affection, your whole heart. He's jealous. And he says, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from the face of the earth. Happy Father's Day. (laughs) Now, it's good for us to hear, though, because the anger of the Lord, which is is different, I I think we don't understand the uh, the, language. we find it hard to believe that God can be angry because we have experienced so little of godly anger before in our lives. We've seen it so little. The anger of the Lord is a settled and controlled opposition towards sin. And, um, and it's stirred when God's people forget who he is, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because when they forget 
uh, who he is, they forget who they are, and they forget how to live. The truth is, the truth about us is that we belong to God, that he has made us for his own glory, and he calls us because he loves us, and we are called to be like him because he is perfect. He's the, he's the perfect, Jesus is the exact imprint of who God is, exactly who he's called us to be. However, it bothers us that God gets angry. We don't like to read that last line, that he could wipe us off the face of the planet. And it bothers us because we think he angers the same way that we do. You could think about some of your worst moments of, of moments where you were in a, either in an implosive or an explosive rage of anger. And you think, God, Hope, I hope the Lord's not like that. I hope he doesn't just fly off the handle like I do. And, uh, you know, I, and I think it's because few, very few of us have ever seen biblical anger in action before, in our, in our own hearts and in our own lives. Instead of biblical anger, we've seen passivity, which is just uh, internalized anger, or we've seen explosion, and I don't have to tell you what that looks like. So I just want you to consider this as we dig in. If God was never angry, how could God ever really love? I mean, if, if we broke our covenantal union with him because of our sin and it didn't infuriate him, would he really love us? Would it make us feel better if God just smiled as our sins separated from him, him from all eternity? No. We want God to care about us and to love us. And God is jealous. He's jealous for me and he's jealous for you. He's jealous for your affection and he's jealous for your worship. He's jealous for your whole heart this morning because you were made for it and you are at your best when you are living in it. Our problem is not that we get angry. Our problem is that we get angry at the wrong things in the wrong ways which reveal the motives of our hearts. I love what Tim Keller says about this in a sermon that he preached about anger. He says, anger is love in motion toward a threat to that which you love. Think about that for a second. Let me, see, let me read it one more time. Anger is love in motion toward a threat to that which you love. God angers at us because he loves us and we forget him and live for far less things in our lives. And we in turn get angry when those lesser loves that we settle for in our lives are threatened. And anger comes when we chase and protect legitimate things that we love, legitimate experiences, legitimate, you know, examples of things that are great and gifts from God that we love, but they've taken the wrong place in our hearts. And the Bible calls those idols. I mean, Anger comes when we chase and protect those things which we think will give us life, and we find that they, in turn, are ruling us instead of the Lord. I mean, just, just think about kids for a second. I'm going to give you a hypothetical that would never happen in my house, okay? Okay, so, you know, kids are unashamed. Uh, they, they don't hide in their anger, right? They're, they're, uh, they just kind of are where they are. Uh, just, just imagine that you had two kids that were at the breakfast table, and they each were pouring cocoa puffs for one another. And just imagine that one of those kids got more cocoa puffs than the other kid got. And then just imagine that that kid that got less cocoa puffs took the other kid's cocoa puffs and dumped it upside down with milk in it on the floor. Explosive anger just right where it is because of that injustice, right? Kids don't care, but it, it's so obvious to us that, hey, like it's better to just be content because neither of you are getting cocoa puffs now, right? But that's how anger works. It just rules us in an uncontrollable way. What is it in your life that draws out anger today? Because nothing reveals the rank and the scale of your loves like anger does. And how does whatever that's making you angry these days reveal what you love? How does it reveal what you're protecting? How does it reveal what you feel like is threatened in your life? What is it that seems to be slipping through your hands that has you sitting with an angry disposition that you are so fearful that God is going to take from you? What our anger reveals is what we love and how much we love what we love. And often my anger, if you're anything like me, reveals how much I love myself. And so it's important to pay attention to what makes you angry, right? 
I found that there are th- really three ways to be angry. The first one is this. It's kind of the unlikely one. It's unreasonable passivity. So this occurs when something that's sinful, uh, and it's clearly sinful, happens around us or to us or to someone that we love, and it's an assault against the kingdom of God and all that stands, and that happens, and it just doesn't even touch your heart. I mean, it's like watching a bad Netflix documentary. You just turn it off. You just tune out of it. You don't, you don't even care. And I would say that this kind of unreasonable passivity that, that plagues, frankly, so many men, to be honest, um, is, a, is a facade of pseudo-peace that is, in the long term, worse than explosive anger because it's never brought into the light. Thomas Aquinas once says, said this. He's a 13th century saint in the church. And he says, lack of passion of anger is a vice because a man who truly and forcefully rejects evil will be angry at it. The lack of anger makes the movement of the will against evil lacking or weak. So if the things that grieve God's heart do not grieve our hearts, we'll frankly do nothing about it. We will not be active participants in the renewal of all things. We will not pursue mercy and justice, which are the weightier matters of the law, as Jesus says. Or hear it from the, uh, the, the fourth century church father, John Chrysostom. He says this, he who is not angry, whereas he has cause to be, sins. Isn't that crazy? Think about that. He's saying like, when you should be angry and you don't, that's sin. For unreasonable patience is the hotbed of many vices. It fosters negligence it inc- uh, and incites not only the wicked but the good to do wrong. And I, and I share these things with you to uproot this idea that it's better to be passive. It's just as bad in the grand scheme of things, and it, and it seems more innocent in the moment. Think about the, the, the original sin of Adam and Eve. Was it not the passivity of Adam that led to the fall of mankind? So maybe you're in here today and you struggle with this kind of anger. No one knows about it, but you're angry all the time. Or maybe you're more familiar with this one, the impatient explosion. That's another type of anger that we see. And I think this is the one that we're most accustomed to. It's, it's easy to spot this type of anger, like I said earlier, because you don't want to be around these kind of people. Um, and, and I just want to say this in defense of those that get explosively angry like myself at times. Uh, not as much as I used to, but still uh, I do at times. Uh, these are people, uh, believe it or not, these are people of deep love. These are people of deep passion. They're probably just not tasting the overwhelming love of Christ to the degree that they need to, that gives peace that passes understanding. The last one is this biblical anger that that the Bible calls slow anger. Let me read Exodus 34 for you. Here's what the Lord, here's what God's word says. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed this to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. Right after merciful and gracious, slow to anger. And abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers and their children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God's slowness to anger reveals his love for us. Our Father in heaven is patient with us. He's kind to us. And his kindness and his patience in our sin, friends, as Romans 2, 4 says, is meant to lead you and I to repentance. So it's not that God just didn't see what you did. It's not that God just can't see your heart when when it's going astray. It's that he is just so loving and he is so delayed and slow in his anger that he is being patient with you so that you might experience his grace and mercy that would transform your heart and life through receiving Christ more deeply. That's what it means for him to be slow to anger toward us. He wants to be with us and desires for our lives to come under his rule and his authority. But as Acts 17 says, his, his patience does have an expiration date. Acts 17, when Paul's preaching at the Areopagus, he says, he says, listen, like, 
God, God has been patient. He's overlooked your sin, but, th- but that's going to come to an end. And so, and so for you this morning, as you maybe experience different types of anger that flow from your heart and your life, I just want you to consider how the Lord has treated you. And then what, what, what that enables us to do is to kind of trace our anger and see where it leads, where, what it reveals about our heart. I, I have a mentoring group that I've met with on and off for six or seven years. They're now juniors in high school. And there was one particular student, um, and, uh, and, and Kavan was just an amazing, amazing kid given his life circumstances, but he went through a really rough stint uh, three or four years ago. And, and in that stint, he, he, uh, he was getting into fights all the time. Every week when I would walk in there, he was in another fight, which meant that I had to go to ISS and visit him, and eventually, you know, some other things happened out of that. And... and uh, <clears throat> And I was so tempted to look at Kavan and say, just stop it, man. Why do you keep doing this? But instead this particular day, I guess the spirit was alive in me, which I'm so thankful for. But I just asked, I just asked a question to him that revealed really where his heart was. I said, I said man, wh- what has happened in your life to make you so angry? And at first he said things like this, well, this kid was picking on me, you know. This kid said something about my mom. This kid did, you know, this and that. But then eventually we got down to the deeper levels and he said, I've never met my dad before. You know, my dad was caught with drugs. He's in jail now. My brothers and sisters and I, we have to keep moving because mom's job keeps changing. And I looked at him and I said, Kavon, you should be angry. You should be angry. But we have to figure out how to channel that anger in a way that is pleasing to God. And so what I want to do now is I want to invite us to begin to learn maybe, or maybe you're on this journey, to see the redemption of anger in our lives. We've been talking about this, but, you know, God is angry at sin, and it's because he's just and because he loves us so deeply that he has to punish sin, and not only sin, but the sinner. You know, we don't don't sin because we're sinners. You know, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners, right? It's our nature. It's how we were born into this world. And God, in his anger, does something that I would never do. He loves us perfectly, and he he lives sacrificially for us. We're going to look at the most angry day in the history of the world now so that we can experience the most loving day. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to look at verse 38 through 46 this morning. Here's what God's word says about this. Jesus says to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful and even to death. And he looks at his disciples and he says, remain here and and just watch with me, guys. And going a little farther, he he fell down on his face and and he prayed and he said, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, this cup of wrath, this cup of God's anger. Let it pass. I don't want to drink it, he says. But nevertheless, I'll surrender. Not as I will, but you will. And he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. How discouraging must that have been for Jesus on his loneliest day. And he said to Peter, could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation, Peter. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is so weak. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass until I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for a third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See to us, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Friends, this is the day that God, in his perfect love, poured out the full measure of his wrath against sin and sinners. There, as I said last week, he poured the whole cup out for all of his anger against all of sin that would ever be committed on the face of earth on that day on his son. And he did this, and he did this for you. 
Think about this. When we had the chance to kill God, we did. When he came near to us, we crucified him. And it shows you what lives inside of each and every one of us, apart from the restraining grace of Jesus, that we would kill a perfectly righteous and innocent man because we love ourselves so, so much. But, but the beauty of it is that the angriest day in the history of the world revealed the perfect love of God freely given for sinners. Because of the anger of God against sin that was poured out on Jesus, the cup of salvation is poured out on you and I, friends. As, as Ephesians 3.19 says, that we would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That God wants to so fill your hearts with his love, with his peace, with his patience and kindness and gentleness and his self-control that it would drive out all of the anger that reveals all of the things that you love more than God. Anger is a byproduct of love. God's anger is slow and he didn't pour it out on us, but he poured it out on his own son for us. God is so, so patient with me, and he's so, so patient with you. But his anger against sin will eventually be poured out. And it will be poured out on Christ for us, or it will be poured out on us. And so I just want to leave you with this today. What does it look like to trace the anger in your life? Let's learn to hunt down what makes us angry and pause and ask God to show us what's, what it's really revealing about what we love. Here's what Ephesians chapter 4 says. Verses 26 to 27. Be angry and do not sin. See, I, the thing I love about this verse is he doesn't act like it's possible to not be angry, right? <laughs> Helpful. Be angry and do not sin. And he says, okay, and then, he, then there's kind of this addendum to that, to that statement. He says, do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So in other words, when anger lingers within, even though it might not come out the way that you think it, 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 you know, it could, it's doing something in you. And I think the great lie that we can believe is that we can leave things in our heart and it will not affect our lives, that it will not harm our souls. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is making it extremely clear that the things that live inside of you will eventually come out of you. And the longer they stay in you, the more damage they do to your soul, the more damage they do to your walk with God. Friends, so just three things about how to trace anger. The first one is this. Confront it quickly with God and with others. Do not be passive about the things that God is not passive about. And I'm serious about this. What things do you tend to just overlook that the Bible does not overlook? The Holy Spirit of, of God living inside of us desires to surface these things. And we, if you've ever been in a situation where you've just snapped, and it was really a, something that was really benign that you snapped over, and you're like, where did that come from? Well, I can tell you where it came from. It came from something else that you let live in your heart, and it just showed itself, right? I mean, some of you are kind of chuckling because you know what that's like. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Friends, I try to take that verse as literal as I can, and sometimes I'm on the opposite of strict extreme where I try, to, I try to reconcile too quickly because I just want it to be over with, you know. Maybe that's some of you too. But don't let the sun go down in your anger means pay attention to your heart. Pay attention to what it is that is angering your soul and take it before the Lord. And, it, and if the Lord reveals that you need to go to another person, go and be reconciled with them. The other part of Matthew 5, 23 and 24 says that your, your heart of reconciliation or confronting what makes you angry with others is more important or is the best way that you can worship. He says it's, if, if you're leaving a gift at the altar and you remember that someone has something against you, go and be reconciled to your brother or sister. That that is worship. Some of you don't need to take communion today. You need to go home and be reconciled. If that's living inside of you, what do you think it's going to produce in and through your life? Do you let your rightness with God humble you so that you can be reconciled to others? I'm afraid that sometimes I am so concerned with being right 
that I forget how I've been made right with God. And how we've been made right with God leads us to be reconciled to the others. Second thing is this, is let the love of God channel the object of anger. So as we see Jesus more and more, we realize more and more what grieves his heart. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's not how long you wait in line or who cuts you off in traffic, but it's the injustice that's all around us. And the more time that we spend with the direct relationship to the word of God that never changes, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the more we see the things that anger the heart of God, that grieve the heart of God. And, 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 and therefore, they teach us what we ought to be grieved by. There are some things that, friends, we just need to let go of. Some things that make us really angry that are not really that big of a deal. And yet, other things that are horrific, according to God's word, that we don't even care about. How does God's word channel what produces anger in your heart? How does it show where your heart is? And lastly, we, we want to learn to express this echo of Jesus, which is a slow-hearted anger against sin. And slow-hearted anger means that we are people that feel deeply. And we have a tremendous empathy. The book of Hebrews, what's it say? He, he was made like us in every way. So there's nothing you can say to Jesus where he can't say, well, I don't know what that's like. He was made like us in every way so he could be what? A faithful high priest. He's our faithful high priest, which enables us to be faithfully present with other people in their brokenness and even in our anger against sin. Because we know what it's like to be caught in sin. And it leads us to deeper, active patience and empathy with sinners, not passive patience. We actively stay engaged with sinners because Jesus ate and drank with tax collectors, didn't he? And the wheat and the tares, they grow together in this world. And we know that if not for the grace of God, therefore go we. This is who God is and this is who God is in us. What is the anger of your life and your heart revealing about where your heart is today? Hey, Pastor Ryan here. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us and watched one of our online sermons. Our vision as a church is to live as the family of God together proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of grace to one another in our city. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church, we'd invite you to attend one of our in-person worship gatherings so you can experience all that God has for us as a community of believers on mission.